Right now on the National Weather Desk, trouble in the tropics, a hurricane and a tropical storm are both threatening land this morning. How hot was the pavement during the summer's extreme heat? Enough to leave a man with third degree burns. There's concerning news about Maine's lobster population and the connection between the weather and when you can stop mowing your lawn. We also have advice on how to protect your plants from frost. Plus, if you missed last weekend's, weekend's eclipse, there's another sky show peaking this weekend. From our nation's capital, this is the National Weather Desk. Good morning and welcome to the National Weather Desk. I'm Angela Brown. Tropical storm watches are posted in the Caribbean just hours after Tammy formed in the Atlantic. This morning, Tammy is located east of the Lesser Antilles with maximum sustained winds of 40 miles an hour. By tomorrow, we'll be approaching the islands of Barbados, Dominica, Martinique, and Guadeloupe. By Sunday, Tammy will be moving away from the Caribbean and is expected to become a hurricane, but it should remain out to sea and not threaten land. In the Pacific, Hurricane Norma is a major Category 3 storm with winds of 120 miles an hour. It should weaken before making landfall late Saturday or early Sunday near Cabo, San Lucas, and Baja, California. And across much of the U.S. is going to feel like summer today. Temperatures will soar into the 90s in Texas and also Southern California. And triple digits are returning to Arizona with Phoenix expected to top 104 degrees. Mesa, Arizona is used to those triple digits, and the city had 104 days above 100 degrees and 36 above 110. That heat left a man scarred for life after he fell on the scorching hot pavement and suffered third degree burns. Alexis Dominguez is in Mesa with that story. He was just a few miles away from home, near Mesa Drive and Main Street in downtown Mesa. One minute I'm, I'm fine, the next minute it's a little a few stars and, and then you're and then you're scarred for life. Young ended up at the burn center inside Valley Wise Hospital receiving surgeries and skin grafts for severe burns from the pavement. That same month doctors there said every single one of their 45 beds in the burn center were full. One third of those patients had fallen on the ground burning themselves. I'm used to go 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 and to have to sit in a hospital bed for two months it, that was that was intense. Nearly 10 minutes passed out on the hot pavement, and his life is now completely different. Recovery is still on its way. I mean, my wound still ain't fully healed. It's hard. Everything hurts. You know, lift, trying to grab something off the fridge with his arm is impossible. The annual Orionids meteor shower is peaking this weekend. According to NASA, uh, they are remnants of Halley's Comet, known for their brightness and for their speed. The shower is set to peak this Sunday, October 22nd. For best viewing, the American Meteor Society recommends watching the sky in the hours just after midnight through dawn. In good watching conditions, you could see up to 20 meteors per hour. Maine lobstermen are bracing for more restrictive catch sizes in the Gulf of Maine. Those restrictions could actually trickle down to your wallet. This comes after a new survey found the population of young lobsters dropped nearly 40 percent over the last three years. But lobstermen have questions about that survey. Brad Rogers explains. These one pound lobsters make up the majority of a lobsterman's catch. But when the American Lobster Board's new catch size limits kick in, lobster will have to return many of these one pounders to the sea. We've always thrown the small ones back. We've always thrown the big ones back. Now our small ones are going to be a little bit bigger. Lobstermen say they want to know how this trap and troll survey was conducted. If you let your trap set four, five, six nights, you don't see any because they've come in, they've ate your bait, and they've gone back out. I see all kinds of small lobsters out there. So that seems to me like we're getting set up right from the get-go. The new catch size limits take effect in 2025, gradually increasing the size of young lobsters that can be caught over the following four years. It also changes the maximum catch size. But if Canadian lobstermen choose to ignore these new catch size limits, they could undermine Maine lobstermen. It's concerned that that's going to undermine the U.S. price, and we're hoping that the managers will have discussions with Canada and try to level that playing field. Marine Resources Commissioner Pat Kelleher says the delay in implementing the gauge size increase will provide Gulf of Maine states the opportunity to coordinate with Canada regarding possible trade implications. These catch size limits are intended to increase the number of lobsters in the Gulf of Maine, but in the short term, Maine lobstermen are likely to take a hit. Obviously, 
going to be less product landed. I don't really spend too much time wasting my thoughts on it because there ain't much I can do about it. They give me the measure, I'll use it. We will catch those lobsters eventually. So there are some definite short-term um, economic implications from changing the gauge because for that year, you're not going to catch those lobsters. But they're still in the ocean to be caught later. As the weather cools, maybe you're wondering when it's the best time to put away your lawnmower for the season. Meteorologist Ryan Miranda explains. Winter is rapidly approaching, which means it's time to start thinking about getting the mower out one last time before we enter into the winter months. And it is a good idea to keep your lawn on the shorter side as we head into the winter months to keep it free and safe for more harsh winter elements, keep the pests out, and it makes it easier to grow back in the spring months as well. A good rule of thumb for when your last mow should be just to keep mowing if your grass is still growing. It may sound simple, but there are a few other techniques that you can watch out for to know when you really want to end mowing your lawn. You want to watch for your soil temperatures to drop below 55 degrees. A really good indication is to watch the trees when they become half bare they lose about half their leaves this is generally a good sign that the grass is really going to start slowing down its growth you'll also want to watch for when their first frost happens that usually marks the end of the growing season and you will want to cut the grass before that first frost usually hits. So this is where our average first freezes look like across the country. Some areas in the northern U.S. typically already have their first frost. You really don't want to cut the grass if it's frozen. Wait to get it a little bit warmer, but some areas in the middle of the country are just about to have theirs in the south and the southeast just about a month away. We've all dealt with cloudy stretches. Whether you love or loathe them, why not have a little fun while they're up above? There are more than 10 types of clouds they each weigh more than a million pounds. Meteorologist Emily Santum takes a look at them. We have our basic cumulus, cirrus, and stratus clouds that folks commonly see, and they all reside at different heights. There are low-level, mid-level, and high-level clouds. Cirrus clouds are high-level. They are cold and made out of ice crystals. You may recognize them too as they are thin and look streaky. Also cumulus and also stratus clouds are mid-level clouds and are made out of ice crystals and water droplets. You may feel the light sprinkles from these clouds when you take your dog for a walk. Stratus and cumulus clouds are low-level clouds. There are some rare clouds out there too, such as asparatus clouds, iridescent clouds, and lenticular clouds. Asparatus clouds look like ripple waves or like a stormy sea. Iridescent clouds are also known as rainbow clouds. If you live in the mountain region, you may be familiar with the very rare lenticular cloud, as they look like floating saucers, usually over tops of mountains. Be on the lookout for the next few days for what clouds you may recognize. And if you love clouds, there is a Cloud Appreciation Society that has more than 40,000 members. Fall foliage is on display, but if you're out in the morning, there might be some fog with those colorful leaves. Meteorologist Alan Seals explains why. The fall season brings out the colors in the landscape, and depending upon where you live, you may not see much of it. So here's a tour. Smoky Mountains Purchase Knob. North Carolina, the National Park Service, just before sunrise in the distance, you saw what looked like a lake. Well, technically it was a lake. It was a lake of moisture, which now you see after the sun came up, is what we call fog. Fog, simply a cloud that sits on the ground. From mid-morning to midday, the cloud dissipated, the fog dissipated. But then by the heat of the afternoon, the water cycle continued, and what was moisture near the ground now in the sky as cumulus clouds. It's a cycle that we see pretty frequently whenever there's high pressure and calm conditions. And you could actually see that cycle on this satellite view from NOAA. Early morning, what you're looking at when you look a little more closely, it's the Southern Appalachians, the Tennessee border to North Carolina. and that region, you have a lot of rivers, the Tennessee River being a major one. And in those river valleys, the cold air settles because there's moisture in the valley that creates high humidity, 100%. And literally, you can see all the river basins early in the morning when the winds are calm. And it's the same view that you would see if you were up on a mountaintop looking down. But certainly fascinating to see, with some pretty fall colors, too. I'm meteorologist Alan Seals. And coming up on the National Weather Desk, we'll talk with an expert about how changing temperatures can impact your health and debunk some common myths about cold weather plus how to protect your outdoor plants and gardens from overnight frost.
I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. We have a nice day on tap today with temps surging back into the 60s with a fair amount of sunshine. Today's probably the pick of the week. After a cool start in the 40s, notice most communities here running in the low to mid 60s. We're already starting to see some clouds increase back in New York. Things start to head downhill on Friday. We'll start to introduce some wet weather during the afternoon, particularly in New England. And more rainfall is on tap heading into the first part of the weekend. I'm meteorologist Sean of the Myers, and here's a look at the mid Atlantic region. Starting off cool, temperatures 40s and 50s at 9 a.m. Some partial sunshine going to bring temperatures up to close to 70 Thursday afternoon at 2.30 and also at about 4 or 5 o'clock. Although we are going to be tracking the next weather maker that's going to be moving at us. You see all that rain around Chicago, Minneapolis, upper Midwest. That all gets here Friday, Friday night on into Saturday. So get those umbrellas ready. That's the scene here. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We are seeing a temperature today in Nashville 73, Tupelo about 76 degrees, Birmingham 73, Pensacola 76 degrees, Charleston 75, and about 84 degrees in Tampa. We're looking at a few coastal showers out towards the Outer Banks. We do have a front that's going to be moving through parts of the Mississippi Delta. A few clouds across Tennessee, looking at beautiful sunshine across Florida, but there will be some scattered showers moving in here and there across the southeast. You are watching the National Weather Desk. In Texas, the summer's drought has taken a toll on many lakes that residents depend on as crucial water sources. Meteorologist Allison Miller takes us to Lake Buchanan for an up-close look at the impact. We are the top of the chain of the Highland Lakes chain. Y'all see what's come, what's up here? <laughs> Not a whole lot. Ken Milam has been taking people out fishing on Lake Buchanan for over four decades, but like the lake, this used to be our store. His business, along with many others, has dried up. You see the white up there? That's the full mark of the lake. I mean, right here, we would be in what? 12, 13 foot of water. There's nothing here. Nobody wants to come to a dry lake. Ken knows we need the rain, but he believes that's not the main problem here. They've got to redo the water management plan so this doesn't happen every few years. How far underwater would we be right now? Right here. 16, 17 feet. Shannon Hamilton, CEO of the Central Texas Water Coalition, a nonprofit fighting to save our water, believes we're worse off than the last dry spell. Compared to the last drought of record, we have a million acre feet less than we did then. Even if El Nino is fruitful, Shannon says it won't be enough. If we only get two feet, that's not going to sustain us. Next year, we're going to have real conversations about who's running out of water. Shannon and Ken believe there needs to be a better water plan in place, but we can all take action to help now. We've got to conserve. We've got to take this seriously. We don't know how long this current water has to last us. And Ken, like many others, is ready for the flood of water and business. It'll be great, that's all I can say, once we get the water back in the lake. Texas is hoping that El Nino will bring some much needed rain to the region this winter, but what exactly is El Nino and how does it impact winter across the country? Meteorologist John Gum has the answer. So what exactly is El Nino? Well, in most typical years, trade winds tend to pile up warmer water off the coast of Asia. However, in El Nino years, those trade winds weaken and we tend to get warmer water that forms off the coast of South America. 
and that in turn changes the weather pattern pretty significantly. So during El Nino years, we tend to see warmer weather conditions across the northern half of the country. Meantime, across the southern half of the country with an active jet stream, we tend to see wetter than normal conditions with perhaps a little pocket of drier than average conditions across the Ohio Valley and mid Mississippi River Valleys. The other thing that El Nino can do is lower the amount of hurricane activity in the western Atlantic Ocean, particularly in the Caribbean. It doesn't tend to impact the Gulf of Mexico quite as much, but generally speaking, we tend to get fewer hurricanes during El Nino years versus neutral years or during La Nina years. So that's something else to keep in mind as we go through the next few months. That's something you're going to hear a lot about. El Nino as it starts to form, perhaps becoming a strong El Nino and having impacts on the weather across the nation. There are places in the country where people are already seeing early morning frost form in their yards. To find out exactly how frost forms, we turn to meteorologist Violet Skybor. So let's say our observed thermometer, which is above ground about five feet, sits at 36 degrees. So when you get closer to the surface, colder air usually tends to sink. The ground temperature will probably be closer to freezing around 32 degrees, even with a warmer air temperature. But either way, temperatures need to be close to freezing in order to see frost. And we also have to have some moisture in the air as well. So with that moisture, the water molecules that are in the air, as they sink with that colder air and touch a frozen surface, which again, we need the ground to be close to freezing, that water freezes over to ice, forming ice crystals, which is that frost that you can see. And also some other favorable conditions to see frost is clear skies, light winds in order to allow those water molecules to settle down on those colder surfaces moisture in the air there needs to be enough of it temperatures in the 30s and moisture on the ground as well so some fun facts you can pass along to your family and friends so what happens if you still have plants outdoors or vegetables in your garden how do you protect them from frost meteorologist garrett hyde has some tips for those still holding on to those late season veggies, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, plants like flowers, corn, cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, and watermelon are all the most susceptible to frost where temperatures range from about 36 to 33 degrees. Broccoli, cauliflower, garlic, lettuce, and onions are a bit more frost tolerant, being able to survive temperatures down to around 32 to 28 degrees. And lastly, cabbage, peas, spinach, and other root-based vegetables can keep going all the way down to around 26 degrees. I spoke with Master Gardener Beulah Dvorak with the Iowa State Extension about a few simple things you can do to extend the life of your garden. So either moving a plant indoors or covering it are going to be your, your easiest um, solutions to helping to protect them. You could use um, old towels or bed sheets or um, blankets and uh, just cover the plants at, in the evening and then um, you want to make sure that you take those um, items off of the plants the following morning. And it's best if you can um, use some stakes or something that will keep the um, blanket up off of the uh, foliage. Well, a sudden dip in temperatures isn't just bad for our plants. It can also be bad for us as well. The changing temperatures can impact our physical health. Emily Gracie sat down with the doctor to learn more about the danger. When you've been in, in a t-shirt and shorts and then the next day, you know, it's 40, 50 degrees, that's a shock on the system. And I say that because it can make your heart go faster because you're not used to that colder temperature. It may be harder to breathe as you're breathing in cold air and you haven't acclimated yet. Are we more likely to get sick when it gets colder out? You know, when weather gets colder, sometimes we see uh, what we call an exacerbation, that certain illnesses are getting worse. And the reason why is that it's harder for your heart to pump when we have these bigger temperature changes because it's a stress on your body. So whether it's very hot or very cold, your heart might need to work harder, particularly when it's cold, because cold often causes our blood vessels to constrict. So it really can have an impact on underlying diseases. You gotta let me know if this is true or not. I think 
every single one of us, our mothers told us walking out the door in the morning, don't mm-hmm. walk out with wet hair. Is there any, can you catch a cold from walking you know, we outside actually, with wet hair? <laughs> we actually just did a WebMD uh, content piece on this. Now, I do not like to contradict mothers or grandmothers, but from a scientific perspective, wet hair is not what causes cold or flu. It's a respiratory virus. So you're breathing on other people, someone's coughing on you, you get those respiratory droplets that are in the air. Cold hair might make you uncomfortable. (laughs) It might not feel great, but it's not gonna cause cold or flu. And before we take a short break, let's take flight over beautiful Montana. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. The rain that was in the plains yesterday shifting more to the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley for the day today and still kind of hanging out there for the day tomorrow. Look at all the sunshine, though, out across the plains, getting up into the mid 80s there in Lincoln and Wichita. By the time that we continue on into Saturday, a quick moving clipper system giving the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley one little quick round of rain there, but still staying very sunny across the plains with temperatures still staying fairly comfortable. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Alex Garcia. Here's a look at your regional weather. Things are starting out a little chilly, particularly for our friends in Amarillo at 49 degrees, Oklahoma City at 54. Everybody else uh, sitting uh, pretty much where they should be, about 55 to 60. Weak cold front pushes through the area today. Don't look for much in the way of cold air. Don't look for much in the way of rain. Just a little bit of a change in the winds. Otherwise, temperatures go back to summertime levels. I'm meteorologist Alex Garcia. That's a look at your regional weather. Well, hi there, everybody. Blue skies and sunshine throughout most of the West. In fact, it looks and feels like summer. Look at San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, 90 degrees there in the city by the bay. 95 out of Vegas, back into the low 70s around Missoula and Spokane at 74. We've had some record warmth, in fact, around the West Coast. Big area of high pressure, our current weather maker, closest rain moving north of us into British Columbia. And that's the scene from here. You are watching the National Weather Desk. And this weekend could bring thunderstorms to several parts of the country, and that means lots of lightning, but not all lightning is the same. Theron Zahn explains, uh, shares some facts with us about the fantastic and dangerous weather phenomenon. Some of the most dramatic and damaging weather involves lightning. It's also very dangerous. According to the National Weather Service, at any time there are around 2,000 lightning storms happening around the world. The NWS says every year in the U.S., around 100 people die from being hit by lightning or from fires caused by lightning. Lightning and thunder are produced in a storm at the same time. The reason you often hear thunder after seeing the lightning is because light and sound travel at different speeds. Sound travels around 760 miles an hour, but even at that speed, the flash gets to you first. Lightning can strike miles from the center of a storm. That's why with any hint of lightning, take shelter. And if you're looking for more content like this, be sure to check us out on social media. You can find us on all your favorite platforms. So search the National Weather Desk. We'll be right back.
Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Angela Brown. Make it a great Thursday, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow.